Bismillahirrohmanirrohim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Mr. Titis Tiabudi, SSMA. The Honorable Lecturers of Department of English Education. The Honorable the guest Dr. Rakib Chowdhury from Monash University, Australia as the speaker for this event. Not mention all beloved students who are present today. First of all, let's thank to Allah who has given us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy. So today we can attend in this special event without any obstacle today. Salawat and salam be presented by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ladies and gentlemen, in this occasion, let us convey the list agendas today as follow. Opening, presentation by Dr. Rakib Chowdhury, closing speech by Mr. Titi Setiabudi, and the last is closing. Now, entering the first agenda is opening. Let's open this event by saying Basmalah together. Before the next agenda, allow me inform you that today we have special guests all the way from Melbourne, Australia, Dr. Rakib, lecture with the same theme about research. Don't forget to take a note and pick your phone in your bag. If you have any question, please raise your hand anytime. And the next agenda is presentation by Dr. Rakib Chowdhury. To Dr. Rakib Chowdhury, time is yours. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you once again. Um, I know that some of you were not present yesterday because you had classes, right? Can you raise your hand, those of you who were not here yesterday morning? So I just have an idea of how many of you may have missed. Raise your hand if you were not here yesterday. You should raise your hand because you were not here. Raise your hand. Just want to have an idea. Okay, so most of you were here yesterday. Most of you, you were here yesterday. So why are you back here once again to hear my boring lecture? I thought I would have fewer students today. Anyway, um, welcome to the second lecture on the course of research paper. And uh, he, as Ms. Shahara has just explained to you, uh, most of you here are in semester four, right? Okay which means you haven't started your research yet. You haven't decided your topic yet. And you haven't done the course on research methodology. Is that right? Yes. So the class and what I'm teaching you might sound a bit um, advanced. It might be a bit difficult for you to understand, but as Shahara said, please take notes so that when you start your research methodology next year or next semester, uh, you will be able to make sense of what I'm teaching today. Even if it is difficult, in the future it will be very easy. So I'm here for, uh, at UMS for only two days. Uh, tomorrow I will disappear. I'm going to... Um, Semarang tomorrow. So I will be leaving solo. But before I leave, while I'm still here, I want to give you as much as I can. And even if it is difficult, try to take notes, ask me questions, um, so that later on, when you do your research, when you start writing your scripty, it all makes sense to you. And I'm here to give you more confidence. To give you, to make you feel more comfortable when you do your research. That's what I'm here for. So let's get started. Just one more thing before I start. This is not a seminar or a kuliah umum or a studium general. This is a class, right? So what happens in a class is students ask questions and students should ask questions to the teacher at any time. It's called dialogic pedagogy. So I would like you not to wait until the end. 
If you have any questions, if you want me to give you an example, if you want to explain something, if you want me to explain something a bit more, make it clearer, please let me know. Just raise your hand and ask me questions, <clears throat> and I'll take your question and I'll answer. All right? Is everyone clear what we'll do today? All right. So I'd like you to take a lot of notes, as Shahara said. Please take a lot of notes. Ask me a lot of questions. Uh, and most importantly, let this class be interactive, not formal, very, very informal. So ask me questions. So take a look at this list above there. Um, some of the things we've already covered yesterday. So these are already done. We've already covered these, right? So yesterday, we looked at academic or scholarly research. And we said that everyone does research. You need to do research even if you buy a mobile phone. You need to do research even if you're a journalist and you want to write something for a paper. You need to do investigation. You need to do comparison, data collection, analysis, discussion, recommendations, implications. You need to do all of this for any kind of research. But academic research is different because academic research has something called theory. Do you remember what I said yesterday? Yes. Non-academic research doesn't have theory. It doesn't have a specified methodology. So that's the difference. So we looked at academic or scholarly research. We also looked at social sciences research, which is different from natural sciences research. So what do we call the natural sciences? What was the term we used for natural sciences? S-T-E-M. STEM, yeah. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Those are natural sciences. For you here who are studying English language education or teacher education or applied linguistics, this is not natural sciences. This is social sciences. And in social sciences, research is different from natural sciences. We also looked at theory. What is a theory? Uh, and today we'll be looking at method methodology. But those items in red are the new items that we'll be discussing today. So we will look at two extended examples of original research to just give you an idea, an example of what it means to do research that is original, not just a repetition, a repetition of an old topic which people have done many, many times. I want you to choose a topic that is original and new and contemporary, something that is very recent. I don't want you to choose a topic that has been researched a thousand times and is already 10, 15 years old. Because I want you to not only stop with your bachelor's thesis, I want you to think beyond that. I want you to think about a master's thesis. And then I also want you to think about a PhD. How many of you want to do a PhD? Raise your hand, be brave, raise your hand and say yes. Inshallah, I want to do a PhD five years from now, 10 years from now, all right? And how many of you want to come to Monash University to do a PhD? Monash University? Yes, very good. You're most welcome. And I've got some Indonesian students at Monash who are doing a PhD right now. In fact, one of them is from Sebelas Maret University, Dr. Yeni Karlina. She's already finished. And she is from this city. So if you choose a topic that is original, if you choose a topic that is contemporary, if you choose a topic that is important in 2023, you are likely to understand research better. Not for your bachelor's, but for your master's and PhD. And finally, we will be looking at the structure of a proposal or a thesis. Structure means what are the different parts of it, the chapters. I will be giving you some hot topics as suggestions for you to take up. Uh, and the last part is we look at the mechanics of writing a proposal. Mechanics means what kind of language, how to do citations, things like that. So it's a lot of things packed up in the next two hours. And I will try to go slow. I don't want to rush so that you feel it is difficult. I want you to understand and make sense of what I'm saying. However, I will be skipping some slides. I'm not going to read out all slides today. Why? Not just because we have limited time, but because these slides are like a reference. You, can, you will all have a copy of the slides. And you will be able to look at the slides when you write your proposal 
Oreo Scripsy, so I don't need to explain. It's just reference material, so I'll be skipping some slides. So let's get started. Do we all feel stronger than yesterday in terms of understanding what is research, what is theory, what is social sciences research, what it means to write a thesis? Do you feel stronger than yesterday? Do you feel stronger? Come on, I need some response from you. You don't have to say yes or no. You can just nod, use your body language. Do you feel better than yesterday? Like I know a little bit about research. Okay, very good. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. So let's do a quick recap of yesterday by looking at some of the things we did. We know that research is not the same as personal experience or opinion or common sense. If you base your research on these three things, then you are probably doing the kind of research that is not academic, not scholarly. You're doing the kind of research that we need for buying a mobile phone or writing a newspaper article. Not the same. We also know that research is systematic, which means they, there is a very well rationalized or well justified methodology. It's not just going out and randomly talking to students, interviewing them, and then transcribing and anal analyzing the data. It has to be systematic. We know that research is disciplined, which means it is methodical. It has principles, and the knowledge that we claim is reasonable, falsifiable, and justifiable. We also know that research is a way where we justify and rationalize the methodological choices, the theoretical choices, etc. And finally, we know research is based on sets of principles and practices accepted for determining what is reasonable knowledge. So it has to be logical, it has to be critical, it has to be systematic, and it has to be disciplined. So, these are some of the things we did yesterday. Do you remember Taketa Naluma? Okay. Which one was male? No. Which one was male? Taketa. Yeah. Uh, and do you remember the shape of Naluma? It was round and soft. And we thought it must be female because it is round and soft. Okay. And we, we know that our perception of Taketa Naluma was based on common sense, our cultural configurations, not logic. So we need to get rid of that when we do research. What about Salju Unta? What kind of point was I making about Salju Unta? Can someone tell me? What, what was it I was talking about? I was saying that the language that we use, the language that you know, can restrict how you think about the world. And because in Bahasa, there is only one word for camel and one word for snow, it doesn't allow you to see the world in different ways, like the Eskimos or the Himba or the Arabs. We've also discussed problems with common sense, research as systematic and disciplined. We've talked about some of the barriers to critical thinking. Remember, if you want to write a thesis, or a scripsy, or a dissertation, you need to be critical. Being, whatever the topic is, you have to be critical. Being critical doesn't mean saying, I do not agree. Being critical doesn't mean disagreeing with someone. Being critical means looking at things and problematizing them. Trying to understand the complexities within something that is perceived as normal. And some of the things that prevent us from being critical are xenophobia, fear of the unknown, cultural relativism, and ethnocentrism, which means, what was the example of ethnocentrism I gave yesterday? Chopsticks, remember chopsticks? The sarong. So in your culture, it's okay, but someone from a different culture would say, oh, that is strange, that is weird, because they judge these cultural practices through the lens of their own culture, and it's a human tendency for us to do so. We have to get rid of all of these things, xenophobia, cultural relativism, ethnocentrism. 
Otherwise, you cannot be systematic, disciplined, or critical in writing a thesis. And the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, the theory of linguistic determinism, which says your language determines your worldview. So this is some of the things we discussed yesterday. So we just did a recap. Is there any question? Do you have any questions on this? Yes, please. Yes, exactly. Observer, yeah, participant observer, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, very good question, yeah. So the yesterday, that's a, you picked up very well. So I said that uh, there is a difference between social sciences research, natural sciences research. In natural sciences research, we have to be objective. The disinterested scientist. It's like my opinion doesn't matter. My interpretation doesn't matter. What you see is what you get. That's in natural sciences. But in social sciences, what you think, how you think, your own personality, culture, these things matter. So in social sciences, you don't need to be objective. It is not possible to be objective. And that is why we need to be aware of our biases, prejudices, ethnocentrism, xenophobia, etc. So when you are doing research in social sciences, you are a participant observer, which means you are not only observing and listening to your participants, you are also participant participating in it because you are interpreting it. And when you interpret it, you bring in your own cultural knowledge, you bring in your personality, you bring in your beliefs and all of these things, right? So there is no need to be objective in social sciences research. And it's not even possible. So instead of saying everything is objective, everything is obvious, we need to problematize it. And we need to say, this is my interpretation of it. It is not the final word, right? You can just say that. Thank you. I want more questions like that. All right. Okay, so this is the other thing that we did. Do you remember the point I was trying to make by showing you this class group picture? What is Wisin Wig? What does it stand for, guys? What you see is not what you get, right? So if a natural scientist was looking at this photo, the natural scientist would come up with some objective facts, objective facts, like the number of male, the number of female students, the total number of students here, uh, the dress they are wearing, how many of them are wearing blue, red, green, the shape of the table, the size of the classroom, um, how many of them are wearing glasses, how many of them are not wearing glasses, how many of them are wearing hijab, how many of them are not wearing hijab, how many of them have a lanyard. So these are all objective, objective observations. That's what a natural scientist does when they look through the microscope or scientific instrument. It's everyone, 10 different natural scientists, 10 different or 100 different natural scientists will say the exact same thing about this picture because it is objective. So if someone says, how many students do you have in this picture? Maybe 30. So if one natural scientist says 30, a hundred natural scientists must agree. They must say there's a hundred, there's, there's 30. You can't say 31, 32. It's an objective fact. That's what a natural scientist would do. But a social scientist will see this differently. They will see that through their own interpretivist eyes. And they will interpret in different ways in terms of why Vietnamese, Chinese, Indonesian students are standing or grouping or clustering themselves together, 
why some of them are standing, some of them are sitting, why some of them are close to their teacher, sitting in the, neck, in the same table, some of them are far away. And why Sarah is standing at the back, because she's from Iran, and the smile and everything, they will interpret it in different, in different ways. It is not possible for a social scientist to be objective about this. Now, you can't rely on your common sense to explain why some are standing, some are sitting, or some are, you know, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Indonesian students are together. You can't use your common sense because you might have biases, you might have prejudices. That's where we use theories in order to explain what is happening here, right? Any questions from this picture? The point I'm trying to make here, what you see is not what you get. So if you have a hundred natural scientists, they will all come to the same conclusion. But if you have only 10 social scientists, they will come with 10 completely different observations, results from this. All right, let's check the homework. Do you remember I gave you homework yesterday? Yes? Now I'm going to check one by one, everyone in this classroom, to see how many of you have done the homework. Let's start with you. There was a homework yesterday. This is a class. It's not a seminar. So there was homework. Have you done your homework? No, look at me. Tell me. No, you haven't. Okay, raise your hand if you have done your homework. Because this is your opportunity to get some feedback from me. And even if it is a very difficult task, next semester when you're doing research methodology, you will feel very confident because I gave you some feedback. So this was the homework. Can you raise your hand if you have done your homework? I didn't give you much time, difficult homework. Anyone? I just want to see one or two hands. Come on, guys. No one has not a single person? All right, very good. Anyone else? I'll come to you. Anyone else? Has anyone done the homework? It was just writing one sentence. I asked you to write one sentence. What have you done in the last 24 hours, guys? Come on. It's just one sentence. Okay, so let me explain the task, and then we can hear from you, all right? Okay, the task was write one sentence, one single sentence, to describe your research as much as possible. That was the task. And because there are so many aspects in a thesis, it is very difficult to squeeze it in one sentence. You don't even need to do it. In a real thesis, you can use three or four sentences, not one. But the reason why I asked you to write one sentence was to force you into thinking very, very intensively to try to think about every single aspect of your thesis in just one sentence. So let's take a look at this. Everything is in here. Everything you need to know about the choices, methodological choices, theoretical choices, research questions, methodology, participants, data analysis, discussion, findings, everything is in one sentence. So I challenge you to do this on your own and get feedback from someone else because from tomorrow I won't be here and that would really make you feel very confident. So it says this qualitative, so that's the approach, not quantitative. Constructivist, which means natural sciences, that's the epistemology. Case study, that's the methodology. We already have three things in the first sentence. Aims to explore, that's the aim. The needs of a group of Japanese high school English teachers, that's the participants, N equals six, six of them, that's the number of participants. In relation to their use of code switching, that's the main topic, by engaging in dialogues through semi-structured interviews, first method, and classroom observations, second method, and identifying objective to what extent the practice of code switching is perceived as useful in second language learning. It says pretty much everything. 
So I challenge you all after I leave to write a sentence like this. So now let's hear it from you, if you can read out. What's your name? Ika? Okay, come over here, Ika. You are very brave, very brave. And I'm sure you'll do very well in your thesis. So read it out very slowly, okay? Okay. Uh, this quali qualitative co constructivist case study aims to explore the impact of campaign parade on the daily working and effectiveness of public facilities such as hospital, school, and public transportation. That's right. Thank you. Did you include the number of participants? Uh, no. Not yet. But very easy, right? You can just insert it. It's already. Did you include the topic? Yes. Uh, yes. It's there. What is it? The topic is? The topic is the impact of the campaign parent. The campaign parent. Can I take a look? Yes. Okay. Very good. Let me read it out. This qualitative constructivist case study, so we have the approach we have the uh, epistemology, we have the method. Aims to explore the needs of a group of, oh, this is yours, this is yours, right? The one, the bottom. Uh, case study aims to explore the impact of campaign parade, yeah, the central topic. What the, the impact of campaign parade on the daily working and effectiveness of public facilities such as hospital, very good. So you have the research site here, very good. And it's a very good topic as well. So all you need to add is the methodology, and the method. So how are you going to collect the data? Such as interviews, classroom observations. So this is 90% done. Thank you. Well done, Ika. Very good. All right. Now I can throw your phone. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ika. Okay. So well done to Ika. That's, that's actually really good. That's very good. Uh, and Ika is brave enough to have written that sentence. Are you in semester four? So you still have two or three more semesters before you do research methodology. And you've already done it. So imagine how Ika will feel in semester six when she said, I got some feedback from Dr. Rokib. And he said, it's good. She will do very well. You need that little bit of motivation, which I was ready to give to all of you. But you haven't done your homework. So I won't be here tomorrow. But I wish you all the best. Don't worry about it. OK, thank you, Ika. Let's move on. So um, what we do is, what's next? OK, I'll just turn it off and turn it on again. OK, come on. Um, Okay, let's move on. Yeah, it's okay. Just the USB. The slide. Okay. Right, I think we're back. We just had some technical glitch.
Okay, we're back. Uh, your attention, please. Please continue enjoying your snack, but uh, please pay attention to me. So, uh, Ika, well done once again. Ika, good job. Um, and let me tell you something interesting. It's a coincidence. Let me tell you something interesting. Uh, two days ago, I was at Ahmed Dahlan University, right, in Jogja. And I had a visiting professor program there as well. And uh, interesting thing is that one of my master's students at Monash University, her name is Ika Suchiwati. I taught her at UNY in 2019. In 2019, I taught her at UNY. And like Ika, that Ika also was very responsive and she gave me a lot of, she asked me a lot of questions, just like you. And two years later, she went to Monash to do her master's. And she has just finished her master's degree. And she's one of the best students in my class. In fact, she got the highest grade in my class, high distinction. So that's what happens when you get involved. So hopefully I will see you at Monash as well. Right? Just like Ika Suchiwati. And she's, uh, she's from uh, Ahmedalan University. All right. So let's move on. Now, this is an article that I wrote for new and beginning researchers. New and beginning researchers. It is a free article. It is open access. And you can download it from this link. Take a photo of this link. It is free. Download it. And you will find definitions of theory, theoretical framework, methodological framework, method, methodology, epistemology, ontology, paradigm, all of these things that you need to know in order to write your thesis, you will find in this article. So you can use it if you want. So just take a look at the um, link. Okay, now choosing a topic for your research article. How many of you, I know you, still, you are still in your fourth or fifth semester. You haven't started doing research methodology. So it's a bit premature to ask you about your topic. It's too early, right? It's too early. But how many of you have decided on a topic? Have you decided on your topic? Can you ra I won't ask you, everyone. Just can you raise your hand like, I know what topic I will write my scripty on topic do you have a topic okay no one has raised their hand let me ask the other question how many of you have not decided on a topic just one what about the rest not yes not no so the answer is yes or no so if i say how many of you have done no one raised their hand if i say how many of you have not everyone should raise their hand why are you not raising your hand? Okay, let's try again. How many of you have decided a topic for your thesis? How many of you have decided? There was someone here. How many of you have not decided on a topic? No, no, I want to see your hands clearly. Come on. How many of you have not decided? Yes, yes. That's what I want to see. It's either yes or no. Come on, guys, you have to be a bit more interactive. I'm not getting that vibe. Looks like you're just enjoying your food, but you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. I'm here to help you, but I'm here for only two days. Okay. So choosing a topic for your research article. What do you see here? Pumpkin. How many of you like pumpkin? Do you like pumpkin? Oh, no one likes pumpkin. Some of you like pumpkin. Okay. So why am I showing you pumpkin? How is it dis related to your thesis? How many types of pumpkin can you see here? All right, stop counting. Now I've got your attention. When it comes to choosing a topic for your research, eight or nine out of 10 students choose the same kind of topic. That is what I see as a PhD supervisor, as a master's thesis supervisor. It's the same topic, and everyone thinks they are doing original research. If you want to do original research, and if you want to contribute 
with your thesis, you have to choose a topic that is different, that is original. That's why we are talking about variety. Variety is good. So think outside the box. Don't choose a topic that is overused, over-researched. So this is a book that came out three years ago by an Indonesian scholar. His name is Suban Zain. And Suban Zain's book is about super diversity and super glossia. So what he talks about here, this is a, an excellent example of original research. So Indonesia, a country of enormous sociolinguistic diversity, 17,000 islands, more than 300 ethnicities, more than 700 languages. So he wrote this book about this diversity, linguistic diversity, which is a topic that I really, really love. And one of the reasons why I come to Indonesia every year and I love traveling in this country is because of this diversity. And within this topic, there are so many other topics that you can choose to research on for your bachelor's degree. So this is just an example. These are some of the topics that are in 2023 considered to be contemporary, new, original, and you can choose from these topics for your bachelor's scripsy. This, of course, is not a complete list of topics. My background is languages education. So these topics are all related to languages education, not applied linguistics, not teacher education, languages education. So these are some of the topics. You can take, you can take a photo of this. And you can say, I want to do research on AI, teaching and learning. Okay? I'm going to give you two examples. So when you choose a topic, you have to remember something. It's not just about choosing a topic and finding out something which we already know. If your research finds out what we already know, then you're not making any contribution. There's nothing new. If there is nothing new, that's not research. You're just repeating someone else's work. So if you choose schooling and COVID, for example, if that's your topic, because everyone's now choosing COVID, or post-pandemic pedagogy, very good. You have to consider a few questions. What do you already know about the topic? Has it already been researched? If it's already been researched, don't do it. How do you know about this issue? Is it from newspapers? or from scholarly research? Is it from social media? Or from lectures, classrooms, books, or YouTube videos, talk shows, TikTok? Who are the stakeholders in the issue? Are you seeing it, so COVID and schooling, are you seeing it from the government's point of view, policy makers' point of view, educators' point of view, leaders' point of view, businesses' point of view, parents' point of view, students' point of view, teachers' point of view? the same topic, schooling and COVID, you can actually have a hundred different variations on this topic. Do you always have to interview students or teachers? No, you can interview parents. Your thesis could be about the views of parents and how COVID and hybrid learning has affected the education of their children. Just about parents. Who are the stakeholders? Who else, what else do you want to know? Why do you want to know this? the rationale. Is there any importance attached to knowing about that? And finally, what could you find out more? Where might you go? What sources might be available? Not just interviews and observations. It could be, you know, a discourse analysis of social media or mainstream media, something else. Think about alternatives. So when it comes to a thesis, it's not just reading a lot of theories and listing them one after another. So it is not an annotated bibliography. It is not, a thesis is not just a list of themes or theories on a topic. You can't just list it one after another. So when you read articles and you analyze the articles, you break everything out and then you synthesize it. And when you synthesize it, one plus one is not equals to two. So if you have 10 articles and you break each of these into five pieces, you have 50 different pieces. 
and then after that when you synthesize want to put it together it will never fit in together that is why social sciences research is interpretivist because 10 different students will do it in 10 different ways it will never be the same but in natural sciences it will always be the same because what you see is what you get okay so let's look at two examples of what you see is not what you get. Now, some of you were present at my presentation yesterday in the afternoon, right? Some of you. So you would remember one of these examples. But today I will go a bit more and I'll show you two videos. So this is the first example. I'll give you two examples of original research. So you take something that is very ordinary, very common, everyone knows about it, no one questions about it, it's like taken for granted, there is no debate about it, and then what we do is we problematize it, we try to look at the complexities. That is how you can come up with a very good research. So look at this map of Indonesia. Look at this map of Indonesia. So we are somewhere here, right? Solo is somewhere here. Is that right? OK. Solo is somewhere here in the middle. Jawa Tengah. OK. Now, this map is not a you know, geographical map. It is a map of one, two, three. The different ways to say one, two, three, satu, uh, dua, tiga. In Javanese, it is CG Loro Telu, right? Balinese Sa Dua Telu. Sundanese Hiji Dua Telu. Minahasa Esa Rua Telu. Lampung Sai Kuta Telu. It's different ways of saying numbers. Okay. Is there anyone here from Sumatra? Or Borneo? Kalimantan? Anyone from Kalimantan? Papua? Anyone from Papua? Is everyone from Java? Anyone outside Java? Anyone Sundanese? Sundanese? Anyone here? Javanese? Yeah. Most of you are Javanese, right? Okay. So this map is um, this this map is uh, yeah. It's okay if you don't pay attention, but if you talk loudly, it disrupts me. So it's okay. Just don't talk loudly. This map is a representation of the linguistic diversity in your country, in Indonesia. And linguistic diversity and linguistic identity can give you many, many original topics for your research. And you're very lucky because you live in this country which has so much cultural and linguistic diversity. If you are living in Europe or if you're living in an, any other country where there, are no, there aren't so many cultures, you wouldn't have had this opportunity. So think about what you could do based on this. Now, in 2019, an Indonesian writer wrote this article called Why or How Javanese failed to become Indonesia's national language? For me, this is not the right question. Why would Javanese become Indonesia's national language? It shouldn't be. Because if you look at the chart here, Javanese is spoken by less than one third of the population. And then we have Bahasa, which is about one-fifth of the population. Sundanese, Malay, Madurese, Minangkabau, other languages. So we're talking about more than 700 languages. So it would not have been socially, culturally, politically appropriate for one language, one regional language, Javanese, to be the national language for the entire nation. It wouldn't be right. Because in that case, you are undermining the importance of the other languages in Indonesia, Minangkabau, Sundanese, you are undermining, so it shouldn't be. That's why we have Bahasa Indonesia, which emerged from Malay and constitutionally became the national language of a country where different parts of the country, people speak in different languages, so it is the unifying language, just one. Bahasa Indonesia, not Javanese. So you can actually critique the standpoint 
taken by Karim Las Raslan saying why linguistic diversity is important and the role of Bahasa Indonesia as a lingua franca. Now, I love traveling. I travel all over the world, but especially in Southeast Asia. And as I told you yesterday, Indonesia is my most favorite country for traveling. And one of the reasons why I love Indonesia is its cultural and linguistic diversity. Now, I have an anthropologist's mind. When I go somewhere, I talk to people. And not just university people, just someone outside in the street, the tourist guide or someone at the grocery shop, whatever. And I try to learn about their language, their culture, their identity, cultural customs and history. That's innate in me. That's, that's what really interests me. I really love doing this. By the way, this picture is not me. It's someone else. I've just put it down there. But I love traveling. And uh, next week I'll be in... Um, um, Sulawesi, <coughs> I'm also going to Manado, uh, I look forward to going to Sorong after Eid, I'll be in Raja Ampat, I'll take some photos and then I'll use them in my next presentation. So I love traveling, it's my interest. So what happened is, I said that yesterday in the afternoon, uh, in October last year I was in North Vietnam in a town called Sapa. And in Sapa, it's beautiful, it's up in the mountains, and uh, it's, it's very cold up there. And the people who live there are the Daozo community. They speak a different language. They don't speak Vietnamese language or Tieng Viet. They speak a different language, linguistic minority. It's such a beautiful place that a lot of uh, tourists actually go there. So I met this lady, Mai Lai, and I interviewed her for about 10 to 12 minutes. And the interview was conducted in English. The entire interview was conducted in English. Would you like to listen to the video recording to see parts of it? Okay. There is also another video of an old lady that I interviewed. So let's listen to this. Can we put the speaker there, Amran? Amran, can we put the speaker? Uh, we'll play the uh, video. We'll play the video. Oh, it's already there. Let's try. All right. So listen to this lady. She has never been to school. She is illiterate. She can't read and write. She's uneducated. And of course, she's very old, obviously. Listen to her speak to me in English. Um, what do you think about this video? This old lady never been to school, never learned English, but I'm speaking to her in English. And of course, she's making mistakes. There are uh, problems with her pronunciation and grammar. But I understand absolutely everything she's telling me. So in terms of intelligibility, there's no problem. There's no communication barrier. There is absolutely no communication barrier. So if I ask you to use this video um, as a prompt of finding a topic for your research, what can you think about some topics in the context of Indonesia? 
Can you think about any topic in the context of Indonesia based on this video? Think about it. Come on, I need a bit more interactivity. Look at me, don't look there, the camera is fine. It will be all right. Okay, can you think about any topic based on this? What could be a possible topic? Because, you know, research in social sciences is always based on real life incidents, like what's happening in the classroom, teaching, learning, pedagogy, curriculum, you know, COVID, artificial intelligence, all of that. So this is a real life situation. How can you use this as an example to investigate something. So how can you get a topic out of this video, what you just saw here? I, w I will wait until someone responds. So I will give you 10 minutes for this. I'll just wait here until someone says something. Now no one is looking at me now. Okay, what would be a topic? Come on. I had a lot of responses yesterday. Today no one is responding. Why? Do you think this might be a good topic for research? I'm trying to help you find a topic so that you can think about a topic for your scripsy. Come on, anyone? Anyone? This is a class. I want more interaction. Okay, anyone? Topic? Can you think of a topic from this video? Just be brave. Do you want to say something? No? Why is everyone so silent? Okay. Forget it. Maybe there's another video. Let's look at my life. So my interview with my life. But I'll just show the first few minutes because I'm not getting much responses. I think the point isn't clear. Here we are. All right, I think we'll just uh, stop it here. Um, any, any questions or any reflections or comments on these two videos, the old lady and my life? Do you understand her English? Yes, um, it's clear enough, right? It's quite clear. Yeah, it's quite clear. So I interviewed her, she spoke in English for about 10, 12 minutes and I understood everything she was telling me and this is a good example of, so I'm, I'm giving you the answer now. Um, my question to you was, how can you use this as data for your research? Because these things happen in Indonesia as well. You don't always have to focus on the classroom or COVID or metacognition or communicative language teaching or task-based language teaching. We're looking for original topic. I want students from UMS from next year to choose topics that are so interesting, so original that your lecturers would be impressed and you will get scholarships to study in overseas university, not just Australia, not just Monash. Because a lot of times we get proposals from students from Indonesian universities and from universities in other parts of the world. Their writing is good, their CV is good, their results are good, but the topic is not original. So if you look at this picture here, you can actually talk about, this is a classic example of the difference between learning and acquisition. 
learning acquisition language learning is conscious and learning usually happens anywhere but it usually happens through formal instruction in the classroom acquisition on the other hand happens all the time because i come to indonesia so often i pick up words and phrases i'm not learning consciously i'm picking up because i'm listening to it i'm listening to bahasa and i'm learning it this is exactly what happened with this lady my life over many years she has been speaking to english speaking tourists and she has picked up acquired words sentences entire sentences and she can answer any question i'm asking her now her acquisition of english was done through tourists from english speaking countries and she was selling her stuff souvenirs so she had to use english but the interesting thing is i can ask her any questions not even related to tourism and she can still answer so it is not just how much you know uh, is this or where are you from how are you it's not that she can use any kind of english when i go to a place like toraja now back to indonesia when i go to a place like toraja it is a very internationally renowned tourist spot a lot of english speaking tourists go to toraja i've been there three times i don't see this happen there so those who deal with tourists in toraja the torajan people they speak torajan not even javanese they don't acquire english like mylai does different country different cultural system different linguistic system that could be a very good topic for your research so it could be not just a comparative study between these so why do the torajans don't learn english because they want tourists to learn their language because they are proud of their language and they say i don't want to learn your language in order to get money from you i want you to learn my language so you might use body language or whatever but i am not going to learn english so you can see that as an example of the torajan people's stands towards the imperialist approach of english the globalist approach of english where english is trying to spread around the world so that's you know just think about how many things are embedded here so here is the question what happens where their when their children go to school my lai speaks english but her first language is not vietnamese her first language is dauzo the minority language when my lai's children go to school they will be learning vietnamese language which is not their mother tongue their mother tongue is dauzo they will also be learning english because english just like in indonesia is taught as a foreign language so they will learn tiengviet they will learn english fine what about dauzo the school doesn't support minority languages so eventually they will forget dauzo and within two generations the language will be lost and this is called linguistic genocide linguistic death linguistic annihilation there are different types of name so it's a subtractive model where languages die out because the system doesn't support it that could be another topic for research example number 2 now those of you who were at my presentation yesterday in the afternoon you saw this slide so some of you have already seen it and i will it will make you laugh let's look at some examples of how english is used in indonesia all right so these are authentic real life examples what do you think about this seafood it means seafood right yeah okay this is bed sheet these are real signs this is how english is used in this country for time it's a lot of fun for time entry please it's a direct translation of mohon entry s crime it will be a criminal offense to have ice cream for the, from this guy 
if you want a free wife, you can go to Indo Maret. Yeah, free wife. Sex dress. Okay, from a spa. Facial, foisal. Cream bath is cream bath, right? All right, there is more. Fried chicken. Yeah. Tahu bakar, no burn. Because bakar means grill, so just burn. Literal translation. This one is for me, tourists. Welcome tourists, we speak English. All right, how about this one here? If you want to translate. So professional translation, but they don't know how to spell the word translate. Even if you want to have private, private lessons. And so these signboards will make you say, rest in peace English. This is the death of English. This is if English is used in this way, it dies. Because, you know, you have spelling mistakes, um, all of these things. And uh, these are English fails. But you know what? Not really, no. They are not funny. And let me explain why. Because these were written, these signboards were written by people who hadn't, haven't had the opportunity and the privilege like us to go to school or high school or university to learn English like us. They are uneducated, they are illiterate. And the spelling that they learned was from how they heard it. You know, like fried chicken or free Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, you know. This is how they have heard and they have put it there. They haven't learned it at school, so they are making mistakes. So if you think about it, yes, of course, it is funny. It is amusing. We laugh at it. But let's not laugh at the people. We can laugh at the spelling mistakes, not at the people, because they haven't studied like us at school. And if the purpose of education is to communicate meaning, don't we understand exactly what it means? We do, right? So when it says free wife, we know it means free Wi-Fi. When it says fried chicken, we know it means fried chicken. When it says uh, Faisal, we know it means facial. Uh, when it says we welcome tourists, you know, wrong spelling, we know that, you know, I'm being welcomed here. When it says translate, we know it means translation. So there's no problem with this kind of language. Can that be a topic for your research, use of English? So English will not die in that way. English will survive in that way. So these are called LL, linguistic landscape. We have, because of globalization, we have the use of English in most countries out in public. And people use English, not just for tourists, but also to convey a message and to show it in a way that is more contemporary, globalized, etc. So we can laugh at them, but it's actually not funny. So if your students make similar mistakes, we correct them because they're at school. These people have made these mistakes outside and no one corrects them. All right, so those were the two examples. One was the linguistic diversity and the state of heritage languages or minority languages in Vietnam. The second one was about the use of English. So I'm giving you two suggestions to see whether you can actually use these authentic materials and examples to find a topic that is original. Now we will look at a different part of writing a thesis. So these are the steps, the common steps, sequences in doing research and then writing a research. You start with a literature review first, not with a research question. Don't start your research with research questions. First, do the reading to find out what the contemporary issues are, what things are already known, what things are still not known, where there is a gap. That's the first thing, not the research question. Research question will come later on. Using concepts and theories, 
from the literature review, step one. And then come with research questions. And only after that, design your methodology. This is the sequence. Don't start with a methodology. Collect data, analyze data, and finally write about the data. What is the difference between methodology and methods? Methodology, methods. One is part of the other one. Methods are part of methodology, but methodology is not part of method. So the overall design, the overall design of how data is collected, participants are recruited, how data is analyzed, how data is reported, everything together is methodology. But method is the technique or the instrument to collect data, such as an interview. An interview is a method. Observation is a method. Focus group discussion is a method because it helps us get data. It is not a methodology. So within one methodology, you can have several methods, semi-structured interview, observation, focus group discussion, survey questionnaire, you can have many things. All right, so this is just a summary of what I have just said. Now, remember what I said at the beginning. Research has to be disciplined and systematic. And one of the ways of making research disciplined and systematic is to have a methodology that is justified and clearly explained. So your methodology shouldn't be random. It should be suitable according to your research questions, according to your topic, not just a random choice. If it is a random choice, it is not justified. Okay, quantitative, qualitative. Now, guys, in the next few slides, I will go a bit faster because these are the slides which are kind of self-explanatory. I don't need to explain every single slide. Quantitative research, the one on the right side, is about numbers. It is more objective. It is about statistical analysis. And it usually involves large number of participants. You can have 20, 30, 40, even 100 participants. On the left-hand side is qualitative research, which is what you are more likely to do. Qualitative research is usually small sample size. You can only have four participants. And the methods would be interviews, focus group discussion, because it is not possible for you to interview 100 participants. It is too much, even for a PhD, 100 interviews is just too much. So, in other words, if you have a large number of participants, you are more likely to use quantitative methods such as survey. If you have a small number of participants, you are more likely to use qualitative methodology, su methods such as semi-structured interviews or open-ended interviews or focus groups. What about mixed method? Mixed method is where you have a study that is both qualitative and quantitative. For a bachelor's thesis, my advice is don't do mixed methods research. It is just too much for you. My advice is for bachelor's thesis, choose qualitative or quantitative, not mixed, because it's more difficult. Maybe it's not even needed. What about the methods of collecting data according to qualitative, quantitative? They are different. So if you're doing numerical, numerical means quantitative. Some of the methods that you would use would be sampling, questionnaire, structured observation, structured interviews, not semi-structured, structured, document analysis, etc. But if you are doing qualitative, then it is observation, semi-structured interviews, focus groups, document analysis, etc., reflective writing, etc. And these are some of the qualitative research methodologies. These are methodologies, not methods, methodologies. The most common one is case study. 
And nearly everyone uses case study for a bachelor's thesis or a master's thesis. And that's okay, that's not a problem. I specialize in ethnography and narrative inquiry. That's what my research area is. But that is also a variation of case study. It's very similar. These are some of the methods and data sources under case study. So once again, remember, case study is a methodology, not a method. Case study is the overall design. And within case study, there are several methods, like semi-structured interview, observation, unstructured interview, etc., focus group discussion. So what you're seeing here is the different sources from which you can get data if you are doing a case study. All right, here is my favorite one, self-study autoethnography. Autoethnography is a kind of ethnography where you are also a participant in your study. So you might have six participants that you are interviewing and observing and getting data in a focus group. But there is also yourself. You are also a participant. So you're writing reflective journals and you're making observations and you're giving reflections, retrospections. And when you analyze the data from your participants, you are also analyzing your own data, your own reflection. And it is written in a narrative manner, like a story. That is called autoethnography or self-study. And in recent times, especially for PhD, autoethnography is considered to be a very good methodology for PhD. For bachelors, you can do it as well, but maybe sometimes your supervisors will ask you not to do it. But it's okay. It's actually a very good methodology. All right, policy or discourse analysis. This is another type. This is called non-empirical data. Non-empirical data or non-empirical study means you can still do a research without having any human participants. You can simply look at documents, policy documents, government documents, etc., and there is no human participant, and that is called discourse analysis. Types of qualitative analytical questions. So whatever your topic is, any topic, you can ask these questions if your study is qualitative. How? Why? What factors? Whatever your topic. So these are some of the questions you can ask. Whatever your topic is, remember these. Once you get your topic, you can use these questions. Now here are some examples of qualitative analytical questions. Not quantitative, qualitative. You have to remember one thing very important in qualitative studies. There are no yes, no questions. You can't use yes, no questions. Yes, no questions are only for quantitative studies, large scale studies. For small scale studies, qualitative studies, you can't use yes, no questions. When it comes to, that was data collection, when it comes to data analysis, there are two levels of analysis. One is general, what you're looking at now, and this is specialized analysis, qualitative analysis. So as I said, I'm not explaining these because they are just lists. And if you haven't done research methodology yet, it would be a bit difficult for you to understand. So I'm just skipping these slides. But later on, when in your sixth semester, <coughs> they'll really be helpful. General qualitative analytical strategies. If I had another two or three sessions, I could have explained each of these individually with more depth. 
All right. So when it comes to qualitative data analysis, you have already collected the data. Uh, semi-structured interviews, observations, you've done the transcription, it's all written. What do you do next? You collect the data and you do the coding first. And once you've done the coding, you generate themes. And I will show you three tables, three tables that you can use to do the analysis of data. By the way, um, because I only have two classes, it's not possible to cover everything. But I will share with Shahara and with Harry a shared Google Drive folder. And in that Google Drive folder, I will put in a lot of these resources, uh, worksheets, tables, uh, readings, articles, and other helpful resources so that you can use them once you start doing your research methodology and writing your thesis. So you will get it within the next two or three weeks. Please ask Shahara or Harry to send you the link of that shared Google Drive folder. And I hope they would be helpful when you start writing a thesis. OK, so coding is when you try to look at patterns in the data. And the codes later on become the themes. So this is an example of a transcript. So you have interviewed someone, and then you transcribe it. You can see the conversation. You don't need to read it. I'm just trying to make a point here. How do you start coding? This is how you do coding. You put in these images, and then you put these words here. And these words become the codes. So you actually do it beside the transcription. There is a tool called NVivo. There is a tool called NVivo, which students at Monash University use to generate codes and themes from transcription. And this is a screenshot of what it looks like. However, you can also do it manually as well. I'm not going to explain this now because you haven't done the data collection. So if I explain this, it would be difficult for you to understand because you are not there yet. Um, but later on, when you start writing your thesis and you look at these slides, they will make sense to you. All right, thematic analysis is the most common type of analysis for qualitative research, especially in case study. It's the most common type of analysis. And I'm sure pretty much everyone in this room, when you're doing your analysis after data collection, I'm pretty sure all of you, nearly all of you, will do a thematic analysis. So you identify codes, you identify themes, and then you analyze them. And when you analyze them, you try to answer the research questions. There are six steps in doing thematic analysis. Thematic analysis is not intuitive. Thematic analysis is not based on common sense. Because you can't just say, my participant said this, and therefore this is what it means. How do you know that? You have to make it systematic and disciplined, not intuitive, not based on common sense. If you do it based on common sense, then that is not academic research. That becomes journalistic research, non-academic research. So how can you make your analysis of the data systematic by following a theory or a model. So what you're looking at is six specific steps by Brown and Clark. And that is how you can make your analysis systematic, disciplined, not random, not unsystematic, non-academic. Non, non All right? So again, I'm not going to explain this now, but later on, when you start writing your thesis, this will make sense. And you would say, oh, yes, I know how to justify my analysis. Because this is, if you use this, it will make you justify your analysis. Every choice that you make, every methodological choice that you make in your thesis has to be justified. And that's how we make it systematic. There is also certain types of advanced analysis, which you don't need to know or don't need to do for your bachelor's thesis. And some of these are discourse, policy analysis, conversational analysis, narrative analysis. You don't need to know that. Maybe for your master's or PhD. That's a different type of analysis. 
<coughs> so for you, I'm just going back. For you, all you need to do is thematic analysis. Right? This is what you need for your bachelor's thesis. Later on, you can do policy analysis and all the different or specialized kind of analysis. But they are more complex and they need more time. You probably wouldn't get that amount of time for your bachelor's thesis. All right. Next, we will look at the structure of a thesis. Now, guys, this is a very important part of my presentation. Structure of a thesis means when you write a thesis, and remember what I said yesterday, thesis means scripsy, means dissertation. It means the same thing. But in Indonesia, for bachelors, you say scripsy, and then you say thesis for masters and dissertation for PhD, but it's the same thing. So when we talk about a structure, structure means the chapters and the sequencing of chapters, right? So let's take a look at the structure of a thesis. How many chapters do you need to have in your scripsy? Six. And this is how it's usually done. Six chapters. You can have more than six. For example, if you have more than one analysis chapter or findings chapter, or you can actually have less than six. You can have five if you combine your analysis and discussion into the same chapter. So it can be six, it can be seven, it can also be five. But usually they're the six chapters exactly in this sequence. You start with introduction, lit review, methodology, data analysis, discussion, conclusion. These are the six you would have, chapters. Now, this slide is very important because it will show you how to decide what to write in which chapter and how these chapters are different from each other. So let's look at the chapters as questions. Number one, introduction, what? Review of literature, why? Because this is why you justify what we already know, what we don't know, why we need to know, and where the gap is. Methodology is how. How will you conduct the research? How will the participants be recruited? How will the data be collected? How will the data be analyzed? How will the data be discussed? How will the research questions be answered? What, this is the second what analysis, what did the participants say? What did the participants agree? What did the participants not agree on? What are the persistent findings? What are the variations, similarities, differences? Discussion, so what? Okay, you've discussed what the participants have said in the fourth chapter, so what? How does that relate to the literature review? How does that relate to the theory or the theoretical framework? How does that relate to everything else? So, so what? What does it mean? Discussion. It is in the discussion chapter that we answer the research questions. We don't answer the research questions in the analysis chapter. We don't answer the research questions in the conclusion chapter. We answer the research questions in the discussion chapter. And that is why we call it the so what chapter. So what? This is what they said. So what? And finally, the conclusion is, now what? We've already answered, so what? Discussion. Now what means, what do we do after that? We've already answered. So implications, limitations, recommendations, suggestions for further studies. Now what? So if you remember these questions, you will have a clear idea about how to sequence your chapters and what to say in which part. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you each of these six chapters separately and the individual components within each chapter so that you can, you can decide what you should do in each of these chapters. And I'm not going to explain everything because it's a bit premature. You haven't started writing, uh, but it, will, it is a generic way of looking at the structure. So whatever your topic is, you will be able to use this structure. So this is the first one, introduction. 
This is what you should write in your introduction, regardless of your topic. It's the same for bachelor's, master's, PhD. It is the same thing. This is what we write in the introduction. Any questions for me? Do you need any clarification, any examples or anything? Just let me know. Don't just take a photo because um, you won't remember the context if you're not taking notes and asking me questions as well. All right, review of literature. Second chapter or literature review or some people call it the theory chapter. Now, this theory chapter or review of literature is not just a list of he said this, she said this, and, you know, all the citations and theories. No, no, no. It's about organizing related work. It's about to show the relationship between this study and that study, similarities, dissimilarities, all of this. And when you do that, don't just be descriptive. Don't just say what other people have done. You have to critique it as well. Because if you don't critique it, then you can't identify the gap. So one of the objectives of the literature review chapter is to identify the gap. Say, everyone, people have done this, they've done this, they've done this, but no one has done this. And I want to do this. So your literature review identifies the gap, and that justifies why you want to do research on a particular topic. Next is methodology. Okay, so remember, methodology means it's the design of, or the overall design of your study, overall design. So in this chapter, you have to talk about everything from methods, methodology, participant recruitment, their demographics, data collection, analysis, ethical issues, researcher positioning, all of that. And when you write this chapter, this chapter is actually the easiest chapter to write. You have to remember two things when you write this chapter. One is that this chapter is not a generic or textbookish chapter. So you shouldn't talk about what is a case study, how many types of case studies are there, definition of case study. No. The more important thing is to say why you've chosen case study. You shouldn't discuss about interviews. You should say why you chose interviews, why your interviews are semi-structured, why you've done focus group discussion why you're comparing males and females, why you're transcribing in a certain way, why you interviewed them in Bahasa instead of English, and then you translated it into English. So this chapter is about rationalizing or justifying all of the methodological choices you've made. So the why is more important than the what in the methodology chapter. Next, chapter four, is the presentation and analysis of chapter. We can also call it the findings chapter. Basically, the findings chapter is where you report what the participants have said. But this chapter is not just a descriptive chapter. It's not like he said this, she said this. We don't do that. Now, look at the highlighted section here. It says theory citations are minimal. So in this chapter, we don't talk a lot about theories because the theories we've already discussed in the literature review and some in the introduction. This is where the participants' voices are the most important. So we have to say what the participants have said, but not just in a descriptive way. It's not just saying he said this, he said that, but we have to actually compare. But we don't use a lot of theories in the presentation chapter. Chapter five, discussion. The discussion is also called the melting pot chapter because everything is happening in this one chapter. You have the research questions, aims, objectives, theories, theoretical framework, uh, and then you have the uh, data itself, the empirical data, non-empirical data, and even answering the research question, everything happens in this chapter, and this chapter is the most difficult chapter to write. And PhD students really, really are scared of writing the discussion chapter because it's the hardest one. It can take several months to write. And you can only write this chapter 
once you've finished your analysis. You can't write the discussion before you've finished your analysis and before you've finished your review of literature. It's very difficult. Conclusion is much easier to write. Discussion is the hardest. So in the discussion, this is what we do. We highlight the main findings. We make direct references to the research questions because we are answering them in this chapter. We make references directly to the theories, to the theoretical framework, etc. In this chapter, we do not make a lot of citations to the data. That is done in chapter four, not chapter five. But we make direct reference to the research questions. All right? So that's chapter five, the melting pot. And Akhirnya, conclusion chapter. This is the final chapter. It is the shortest chapter. It is a summary of the main findings, but we don't want to make any repetitions. It talks about the contributions that you're making, what you've added to existing knowledge. You also talk about limitations, what you haven't been able to do. It does not have to generalize or be conclusive. You don't have to say, there was a problem, I solved it, full stop, nothing else to do. No, because that is very objectivist. A natural scientist can say that. A social scientist can never say, this is the solution to the problem, full stop. Because we are interpretivist. The same data, 10 different social scientists will explain it in 10 different ways. There is no one answer. So we have to talk about recommendations, limitations. Do not generalize or be conclusive. And finally, the most important thing is citations are minimal. We don't have to cite a lot in the conclusion chapter. This is your chapter. So if you use too many citations, it minimizes your own positioning. A few more notes on the conclusion. Summary of persistent findings, the most outstanding findings, not everything. Unexpected findings, limitations, contribution, implication, recommendation. And finally, the last paragraph of your conclusion chapter should be positive. That's my tip. Even if the findings are negative, even if the findings are pessimistic, not very hopeful, we should always end a thesis with a positive note, with the hope that things will get better in the future. Right? That's my tip. Now, for data analysis, this is the correct order, the data analysis. So this is chapter four. This is how we should do it. All right, now in the next three or four slides, I will show you tables, some tables that you, these are reference materials, so I won't explain them. You can use these tables to organize your ideas, your thoughts, in order to really be able to analyze well, do your reading well, write a good literature review, plan your research, and finally write your thesis. So instead of starting to write your thesis from the first day, as a starting point, you can use these, two, these three tables to organize your thoughts first. And then you can write later on. It just helps you, makes you feel much better. So here's the first one. Questions for research design. How do you decide on your methodology? Where do you start? It depends on your topic. It depends on what you're trying to find. What you're interested in depends on the purpose kind of data you want to generate, analysis approaches, and informing sources of the data sources. It's very easy, but you should do it before you start writing. All right. Now, I will have these tables in the shared Google Drive folder, right? So you will have a copy of it, a blank copy, and then you can fill it in. Please fill in these three forms before you start writing your thesis. Here is the second one. What about reading? You will have to read 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 articles for your thesis. Don't start writing the literature review immediately after you read. First, do this table. Do the table first, put your notes down, make the comparisons, and then start writing the lit review. So let me show you an example of a filled in form. There you go. So we have three articles here, one by, uh, what is it, Halsey et al., one by Aman, one by Zembailas. Three articles. 
So you read the articles and you take notes for yourself. Once you do this, it becomes much easier for you to write the literature review. So again, the blank um, tables would be available on Google Drive. What about data analysis? Again, don't start writing data analysis right after you transcribe. Do the grid first, this grid. Highlight the keywords. Identify the codes. Identify the themes. And then start writing chapter four, data analysis. So this is where it starts. Sample organizing maps. Once you have collected data and you go back home and you transcribe them, you look at everything, all the transcriptions, and you'll say, oh my god, well, where do I even start? Just too many things. You will feel very overwhelmed. So what you can do is you can make a visual map of this just to make you feel much better, like you are in control of everything. All right, now this is the last part of my presentation, and I'll be finishing in about 10 minutes. The mechanics of academic writing. We've looked at the structure, the six, um, the six chapters. We've looked at theory, theoretical framework. We've looked at what it means for research to be systematic, disciplined. We've looked at two extended examples of original research. We've looked at hot topics and contemporary topics for research. So this is the last thing remaining, which is the mechanics of academic writing. What do I mean by mechanics? Mechanics of academic writing doesn't mean grammar or vocabulary or syntax. We are talking about the kind of language that is appropriate for a thesis. Because the language of a thesis or the register of a language for a thesis is different from the kind of language that we use in other genres. So the English language, the type of language, the type of register that we use in a thesis has to be very specific. The kind of language that we use in an email, for example, that can be very informal. We can use certain words, not a problem. But when we write a thesis, we are talking about different registers. So let's take a look at some of these. All right, so one thing important in thesis is navigation. Navigation means guiding the reader who will read your thesis in trying to understand why you've written something in a particular section and how that section is related to what you've written previously and how that is related to what you will write later on, connections. So this is called navigation. So you can have an advance organizer. So an advance organizer can be just one sentence or two sentences. It can say that this thesis has five chapters. In the first chapter, I'll do this. Next, I'll do this. Next, I'll do this. And finally, I'll do this. So it's an outline of what coming, what's coming ahead. So that's called an advance organizer. And then there is something called cross-referencing. So you can say, as discussed earlier, or as I will discuss later, so you can use these words there, so you are helping the reader connect something that you have already said, or you're indicating something that you will say later on. So these are called maps and overviews, very, very important. So some common problems. These are the most common problems in academic writing in a thesis. One is long paragraphs. A paragraph should be around maybe 100 or uh, maybe 120 words, not longer than that but some students write really long paragraphs. Wrong citations and referencing style, non-academic and questionable references. So if you use Wikipedia, for example, if you use a dictionary, these are not acceptable in a thesis because they are non-academic references. Fragments and run-on. Abrupt transition, which means you've written a paragraph and then suddenly you're moving to a different topic in the next paragraph and there is no connection between these two. It's very common. And just because you've written a topic sentence is not enough. Because topic sentence means it's the topic of that paragraph. But how is it connected to the previous paragraph? It's very abrupt. No mapping, overviews, or advanced organizers. Overquoting. Overquoting means there are too many citations. There's so many citations that what you are trying to say is not clear. It's like everyone else is speaking, but I can't hear what your, vo your own voice and uh, conclusion or no conclusion or abrupt end. All right, no signposting. 
These are the sec these are the examples of signposting. In this section, I will outline or having demonstrated this, etc. Poor development of argument. No consideration of opposing arguments. As I said, if you want to write a good thesis, you can't do cherry picking. Cherry picking means only using citations that you agree with. You also have to include citations that you do not agree with. Not just arguments, but counter arguments, because these would enrich the quality of your theoretical framework. So we need opposing arguments as well. What else? Cliche, generalizations, hyperbole, informal language, no supporting evidence. You have a claim, but there is no supporting evidence. Lack of critical reflection on readings. What else do we have? Simple summaries of literature, no synthesis. So this is what I meant by your literature review should not be descriptive. It should be critical. Don't just describe, he said this, he said that, according to this, or he argued this, she argued that. No, that's just descriptive. It has to be analytical. Not making own voice come through. That's another problem. What else? Cultural insensitivity. Poor referencing. Scholarly referencing. Lack of scholarly referencing. Repetitions. A few things to keep in mind. Okay, I'll just let you read this because there is nothing to explain here. So these are all the mechanics of writing a good quality thesis. The mechanics. If you have any questions, of course, you can ask me. Now, I want to draw your attention to hedging. Hedging is very important in social sciences. Hedging, very, very important. Hedging, this one here. In social sciences, this is very important. In natural sciences, it is not important. Hedging means a non-committal sentence. Very easy to write. It has nothing to do with grammar. It's not a big deal, but it's very important. So instead of saying, I have proven that, this study has established that, this study has proven that. Instead of that, we need to say something like, it is possible, might, likely, appears to be. Because someone else, because it's interpretivist, might come up with a different conclusion. So instead of saying, I have proven that, you can say the study, the findings of this study suggest that. Okay, softer language. That is called hedging, very, very important. And a few, a, more few, uh, a few more things here. So yeah, this is actually hedging. Instead of saying it has therefore been proved that, or it can be concluded that, instead of using this kind of language, it is better for you to say it is likely that, it appears that, findings indicate that, evidence just that. And a few more things here, self-explanatory. We are nearly done, guys, we are nearly done. You can just take a photo, just try to remember these, just to make sure your language is of the quality expected in a thesis. Okay, this is the last slide. As I finish teaching uh, this class at UMS, before I leave tomorrow, uh, this is my advice for you to remember when you start doing your proposal or thesis or research methodology. And this advice is based on my experience of teaching. I've been teaching for 26, 27 years. I've been supervising PhD students for 13, 14 years. I've been you know, supervising master's students as well, teaching. So it is based on my experiences. So you can say this is my personal advice to you. Uh, so that you all do well in your thesis writing, okay? And as I said at the beginning of today's class, some of what I say today might not make sense to you because you are still in your fourth semester or third semester, and this is probably a bit ahead of you. So, you know, there is a gap between what you know or what you're studying right now and what I'm teaching you. So there is a gap. It might be a bit difficult. But very soon, when you get into your research course, 
if you come back to this presentation, and it's being recorded there, Arif is recording it, um, it will actually be helpful at the time, all right? So look at my advice and try to think about them and keep them in mind when you start your research. Here's the first one. For your thesis, choose a topic that you really care about, not because it is cool or because your friend, you know, your best friend has uh, chosen this topic or because your lecturer has suggested that it's a good topic. You should choose a topic that you really care about, okay? And this topic is likely to be a topic not just for your bachelor's thesis, but something that you might be interested in researching further, writing a publication on it, doing a master's thesis on it, doing a PhD dissertation on it five years from now, three years from now, you never know. So choose a topic you care about, something you find interesting. Number two, choose an issue or problem, not a topic. Don't choose AI, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a topic. It is not a problem. It is just a technology. It is not an issue. The problem is when you use or how to use AI in relation to plagiarism, in relation to whether teachers will lose their job, whether it would make students lazier, whether it would stop students from being uh, metacognitively aware, etc. But AI itself is just a topic. It's not a problem. Right? So when you choose a topic, think about a problem or issue, not just a topic. Number three, perform research with your heart. Don't do it just because it's part of your studies and you need to pass and get your bachelor's degree. Put some effort into it. Try to enjoy it. Do it with your heart. Invest in it, okay? Not just for your studies. Be truly knowledgeable about latest research. So if you're doing research on code switching or, as I say, linguistic diversity, make sure you know what's the latest research on this. Don't just use citations from 10, 15, 20 years ago. You might get away today, but later when you want to apply to uh, Monash University or some other university overseas, your prospective supervisor would say, hmm, okay, very good, impressive resume, a lot of publications, but the topic is... Uh, it's ancient, it's too old, it's not contemporary, things like that. So make sure you know about the latest research. Read the latest articles. Try to see the real contribution you're making, not just your final grade. What's the actual value of doing a research? Are you doing it just to get a certificate? Or do you want to actually make a change in the world? Engage in constructive conversations which means two-way conversations to learn more with your supervisor, classmates, academics from all over the world. It's very easy to contact academics and colleagues and lecturers and supervisors from anywhere in the world. You just need email or social media or whatever it is. It's easy. And finally, this is my motto. Good research is always collaborative, not competitive. This is what I always, always tell my students. Because a lot of academics, a lot of professors, they see research as competition. They see research as competition. competition. I see it as cooperation. So let's all help each other. Let's do research together. That's the power of collaboration and do better. Thank you very much. That's the end of my second lecture. Thank you. Okay, guys, if you have any question, please feel free to interrupt. And yeah, this is, um, it's just a class, so, you know, they can ask me questions at any time. We still have, um, okay. what, 15 minutes? So, yeah. This is your last chance to ask me questions, because as I said, I'll disappear tomorrow. You won't see me again. Um, so, if you're really serious and if you want to learn, we've got one there. Anyone else? Yeah, we'll need a mic for him. Good morning, all. I am Lamin Kaira, international student from Africa. 
Sierra Leone. Uh, specifically, I'm a, a master's student. I'm doing my research presently. Today's class is very important to me, and I've learned a lot, and it is very, very imperative. Uh, moreover, I have a few questions to ask. Uh, sometimes when doing a research, especially in Africa, some institutions refuse to give you their question, they are, uh, refuse to answer your question. Yes. Now, presently, I'm doing a, a research on the GST, the impact of GST on the social sciences in our countries, the impact of GST in the development of the countries. I'm doing an article on that once. I've written the articles. Present, uh, I've sent my questionnaires over two months without answering the questionnaires. What a researcher is going to do about that? One. Two. Uh, um, sorry. That, okay, um, your research is about GST. GST. Like yeah, and it's in the, the sector of tourism in Sierra Leone. Yes. Yeah. The, an analysis of the impact of goods and services tax and its implications in Sierra Leone economy. Yes, very good question. But uh, I mean, uh, what is the exact question? Uh, can you repeat the question once again? Okay, uh, yeah. I've sent the questionnaires, but there was no response of the, to answer my questionnaires for analysis. So as a researcher, what am I going to do with that questionnaires? Because I've almost written the articles. It's only the analysis aspect now to conclude everything. I, I couldn't get value of that one. So is your question about how you will collect data? Yes. Okay. No, uh, if, you fail to get, if you fail to get the data from the, uh, the, the case study, what are you going to do? I think um, the, if you fail to get data, you can do two things. One is you can change your method. Wow. So instead of interviews, you can look at documents and do a document analysis. Um, and that could be government policies, um, documents from the ministry, or even from tourism or whatever sector it is. So it is possible to do research on the impact of GST in Sierra Leone's economy without interviewing people. You can still look at documents. That's an alternative. Or secondly, you can still do it with uh, people but you can choose people from different sectors. So whether they are businessmen or whether they are industrialists, so that's another possibility. But you can always adjust your methodology if you find it difficult to collect data. Uh, another one for the discussions. Uh, as you said, uh, discussion sections is one of the most critical and important aspects because it gives the final verdict of whatever you are saying to the public. Uh, is it possible to bring an uh, empirical review under the discussion sections uh, with the citations? Uh, no, because... Um if you want your findings to be empirical, if you want your study to be empirical, yeah. it has to be based on primary data, not from data collected by someone else in a different study. I mean, you can use it, but yeah. that's not your finding. Sure. That's finding from a previous study. So you can, you, in that case, you have to get your own empirical data by interviewing people, not just document analysis. Oh. <laughs> and then comparing your findings with findings from previous studies. Otherwise, your study is still okay, but it is non-empirical. Okay. If you're using only documents, right? Yeah. Finally, I thank you so much. Monash University is my dream university. All right. I'm, I'm even planning to apply this year oh, fantastic. for my PhD at Monash University. Thank you. Very thank much. you. What's your name? Lamin Kaira. Lamin Kaira, I look forward to seeing you at Monash and uh, hopefully from Sierra Leone to Indonesia, See? finally to Australia. Thank you. Inshallah, inshallah. All right. All right.
Right, any other questions? This is your last chance, guys. This is your last chance. You can ask me any questions. Yeah, we have another question there. Anyone from this corner? Uh, you guys want to leave, don't you? Some of them, hello at the back. Hey, guys at the back. They don't even know I'm talking. Hey. I think you just want to leave, don't you? Well, we only have what? Uh, we have five, six minutes. Don't worry. I'll be gone soon. Okay. Uh, my name is Farida, and I am from the sixth semester. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask if a majority of us, because English is also our second or our addition language, is it okay if we use the web for conducting uh, our mechanism in writing? Because I think my major problem for being the sixth, uh, sixth semester, making the uh, any proposal or any analysis, my lack is from the vocabulary. Yeah. So when I write, it I think it's informal. And how do we know that it is informal? No, how do we know that it is formal for us to be uh, for right, us yeah, to know that it is valid? Yeah. And is is there any maximum or minimum for citation in a thesis? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll use this mic because this one sounds a bit weird. Okay, so uh, two questions. First one is the quality of your writing and the appropriateness of your language for a thesis, whether it is appropriate. How do you know that, right? Yeah. So we were talking about the register and the mechanics of language, whether you can use a web service for that. Um, the first thing is you will get some feedback from your supervisor who would tell you if it is appropriate or not, right? I mean, your supervisors, don't they give you feedback on the language? Farida? Uh, they do. Well, they sometimes, should, they should. sometimes the supervisor doesn't check the, the work that we have. They should check. I hope no one is hearing <laughs> me. <laughs> I mean, they usually just give us grades. That's yeah, why. Yeah, exactly. You know, at Monash University, uh, we have to meet our students every two weeks, once every two weeks, give them extensive feedback. So if they send us uh, writing that is just eight to 10,000 words, it, take us, it takes us two hours, even if we work very quickly, to leave comments for them, track changes, and that includes the content, the language, everything. Anyway, so the, the first call, port of call is your supervisor. But if your supervisor doesn't help, can you use web services? You can now. I'm not aware of any web services that can check your language and polish it. I'm not sure whether you can do that. But if there are there some artificial yes, intelligence? Yes, there is one web that we usually use. It's yeah. called Paraphrase Quillbot. Yeah. And but sometimes we do not know that it it is valid or not. No, I I don't know about that, and uh, none of my students have ever used it. So I don't know if it is valid or not. But you have to be very careful with things like plagiarism and acknowledging external help. So, for example, at Monash University, even if a proofreader has checked your thesis, even after you've finished writing it, like it's all done, they're just proofreading it, even that has to be acknowledged. Yeah. Now, that is because we have ethical guidelines at Monash University. I don't know if there are any such ethical guidelines at UMS, but you have to be very careful thinking about the future that any kind of external help that you've sought in order to uh, enhance the quality of your writing um, you have to acknowledge that. All right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is the more you write, the better your writing gets. So eventually it will get better. It will, it will become much better. What was your second question? Is there a maximum or minimal of citation in a thesis? Okay. No, there is no maximum. There is no maximum because it's very difficult to judge the number, the density of citations. It would depend on the length of the thesis, right? But I would say... Make sure you don't have too many citations. If you have too many citations, you might think your examiner would be impressed to see, oh my God, 50 citations, that's really impressive. But it's very easy to write citations, even if you don't use them. Yeah. It's, you just put the brackets in there randomly and it means nothing. If you have too many citations, the problem is your own voice will be drowned. If there are too many citations, your own voice is drowned. It is silenced. 
So too many citations is not a good idea. You should have a nice balance between what other people are saying and what you are saying. And remember, Farida, what I said. You will have citations in the lit review, of course, some in the introduction, some in the methodology, but we don't want many citations in the conclusion or the analysis chapter. So the density of citations is not the same in all chapters. In some chapters, it is more about you, including the conclusion. In some other chapters, it is half and half, you and others, right? Okay. Thank you and best wishes with your, you're in the fifth semester? Uh, I'm in the sixth. Sixth, so you've just started or you're about to start. Yes, I started the fifth, the research methodology. Very and good, yes. Yeah, so now I'm doing the okay, thesis. So that's good. I hope this presentation would be helpful in your studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. All right. Maybe another couple of questions. Uh, yeah, maybe two more questions. Yeah, here we go. I want someone from this side. There's no one in this side asking me questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohsin, and I am from sixth semester. Yesterday's slide, you show us your biography. And Mr. Rakib, you have double master degree. The first is master of English literature. And then the second is master of TESOL, or teaching English. My question is, in our undergraduate program, we have three courses that talk about research methodologies. The first is research methodologies of teaching, and then the second is linguistic, and then literature. So we have three options to be our last thesis in our undergraduate program. Uh, and not all of us take teaching as a thesis topic. Some of us take linguistics, some of us take literature. So if we take maybe uh, literature for our thesis in this undergrad program of education, should we change our major if we want to take master degree in the future? Uh, Mohsin, the interesting thing is what you described is exactly what happened with me. So as you pointed out, and you have very good memory, I have to say. You remember my credentials. So my, my first degree, bachelor degree, was in English literature. My second degree, master's degree, was also in English literature. But my third degree, which was my second master's degree, was in TESOL, education. So switching over, right? Switching over. And then my PhD was in education. So I actually started with literature studying literature, sastra, and teaching literature as well. And then I switched over to education. Because when I applied to study at Monash University, the scholarships were only available for TESOL and education, not for literature. It wasn't available. If I, if, if I had chosen literature, I probably would be talking about literature, not about linguistics or teaching, right? So in my case, I had a career shift disciplinary speaking from one discipline to another. So in your case, if you are doing literature now, you can still choose to do your thesis or your research in something else, not literature. So it could be education or what's the other one? Teaching. Linguistic. Linguistics, yes. Linguistics or teaching or education, right? Uh, and it is still possible to mix and match, not a problem. So if your background is in literature, and if you're still interested in literature, you can still use literature, but in linguistics or in education for your research. There are actually several topics where you can mix and match these two because research is more fluid. Research is more interdisciplinary. So you can mix and match. So in my own research, which is based on education and languages education, I also use economics policy studies, anthropology, sociolinguistics, and a few other subjects. I, I actually mix and match. So literature is more multidisciplinary. You can mix and match. It's not a problem. It doesn't have to be literature. All right? Thank you, Mohsin. Thank you. All right, maybe one last question, I think. Yeah? OK.
Is that all? That's all? Yes, the last question. Oh, we have one more? No? Yeah, I think that's all, right? That's all. Okay, um, so thank you very much. Don't run away. I want to take a group photo with everyone in the class. I want to take a group photo with everyone in the class. Yeah, yes, sir? I want to take a group photo with everyone oh, okay. in the class. After this. Yeah, but I'm done. But uh, anyway, thank you very much. She will close now, but that's all from me. Thank you. Maybe see you next year. All right. Thank you for Dr. Rakib Chowdhury for the wonderful material. Before we end this event, a closing remark will be given by Mir Siani Prastiwi, PhD, as Secretary of Magister of English Education. For Mir Siani, time is yours. Okay. I'm not that tall, so I have to lower it down. I'm just this height. Morning to you all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Master of Ceremony, for giving the opportunity. Morning, Dr. Rakib. Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to deliver these closing remarks first. Um, on behalf of the head of the English Department, undergraduate and graduate program, I would like to grant our gratitude to the first Dr. Rakib Chaudhuri, our visiting lecturer from Monash University, who has uh, so generously shared his uh, insights, knowledge, experiences with us. And then the second, the committee who has worked hard to prepare and set all things that we can gather in this scientific meeting. The third international office, BKOE, uh, who ha uh, which has supported this program. The last one, lecturers and student participants who have happily joined uh, these two days precious meetings. Alhamdulillah, thanks to Allah that all sessions have been through fabulously. Hopefully, this visiting scholar program keep continue in the future and hopefully there would be a follow up from the department to have kind of a working collaboration between our department and Dr. Rakib, personally, uh, between uni to uni, Monash University and UMS. Again, thank you, and see you all sometime in a better occasion. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you for Ms. Yeni. Ms. Yeni, please stay on the stage for a while. The next agenda is presenting a token for the speaker. A certificate for Dr. Akib will be handed by Mirsiani PhD. Yes, thank you, Ms. Siani. You may be seated. The next souvenir for UMS will be handed by one of the DEE lecturers, Ibu Sumaya SSMA. Thank you very much, Busumaya.
Ladies and gentlemen and fellows DE student, now we come the last part of our agenda, but before we can take a picture together. going to have photo sessions, please all the audience to arise with, the, uh, with Dr. Rakib. Uh, the photographer, first you can get on the stage, so we're talking from that angle to here. Yeah, tolong berdiri dulu semuanya. Sini, yeah, over here. Bu Maya? Panitia sekalian yang beberapa yang bisa, yeah. Just right in the middle, are we, okay, Rakib will be here. <laughs> Stand against this pillar of the one that you hate very much, yeah. Bu, Bu Maya sini boleh? Bu Maya sebelah sini boleh? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay no. <laughs> Everyone wants to take a picture with you suddenly. <laughs> okay, agak mepet ya. Yang sana agak mepet boleh, boleh, boleh. Bisa enggak? Yang yang bisa fish eye kemarin punya siapa? Aduh, ya Allah, ya sudah. Okay, one, one, two, three. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. And then you can you can stand on the middle. Ah, okay, that's good. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, one, two, three. Mas Aji bisa ke sini aja, yang yang ini. Okay, kayak bebas yuk, kayak bebas freestyle, freestyle. One, two, three. Again, again, one, satu lagi yuk. One, two, three. Oke, okay, thank you very much. Sebentar, du uh, silakan duduk dulu sebentar, ini mau ditutup. Jangan, jangan keluar dulu, ini mau ditutup dulu sebentar, sebentar ya. Jangan, jangan keluar dulu, duduk dulu.